how is it possible to gather all the same safety data in a matter of months that normally takes several years? Hi, thanks for having me on. Um, this is something that uh, we've been asked throughout. And it's important to understand that uh, these COVID vaccine trials have been prioritised, not just here in the UK, but globally. And so a lot of the, the red tape and, and uh, the uh, trial processes that might slow things down have been moved aside so that we can all work on this simultaneously. And, and we saw earlier how the different phases of the trial have been moved uh, together in, in some sense. So that, that has allowed um, the uh, data to be accumulated more quickly and also for very large trials to happen um, globally in order to create very large safety databases, which is what we need in order to um, assess these vaccines. So it's really about prioritization and it's about a global effort to uh, collect the data that we need in order to make the right decisions. Professor Salisbury, how many people need to be vaccinated for us to be able to reach a point where we can start to unlock and then reach herd immunity? Well, I think that there are two strategies within this vaccine uh, campaign. The first is to protect the vulnerable. And that is what we've been hearing about, about with priority lists and so on. So we protect the vulnerable because they're the most likely to die or to suffer the, the really serious consequences. And protecting them won't stop transmission. They will be protected from dying, but the virus will still be in our communities. So the second strategy is to stop transmission. And that will require vaccinating a lot of uh, young, healthy people who themselves can suffer from this virus, but who also can pass it on. Now, with a 90, 95% effective vaccine, that's really good news because you multiply the effectiveness of the vaccine against the uptake. And as long as those two numbers are gonna come out at somewhere between 60, 65%, then we're going to be able to say, we have a good chance of interrupting transmission. But if we don't get the coverage and we were using a lower efficacy vaccine, it would be more difficult to interrupt transmission. So it's really impossible to know yet until we see how well people respond by coming and being vaccinated. So, so you're saying that if we get, say, three quarters of the population vaccinated with the Pfizer jab uh, at over 90% or 95% efficacy, then we're there. But if we get perhaps 65% of the population vaccinated with the, the Oxford vaccine, which is said to be 75% at the moment, we don't get to a stage where we're back to normal. I think that is exactly the dilemma that we face. If we've got 90, 95% vaccine available to us and we use it for the high risk people and we protect them, that's a fantastic result. But we've then got to think very carefully, what do we do for the rest of the population with a vaccine that may not have a 95% efficacy, and I think it was 62% that the uh, result came out at. And we have to protect large numbers of people to try to stop transmission. Dr Pollock, does that mean people are pinning perhaps a little bit too much elation on today's announcements? I think today's announcement's really positive. Um, as we were hearing just there, because it, it, it does mean that we can start vaccinating people against disease. And uh, that is what people are so frightened of. And that's what they want to hear from a vaccine. That's why we are developing these vaccines. But it's absolutely true to say that we need a public health strategy. There's a very large population in this country who need to be protected and that that can't happen quickly. So we need to prioritise how we use our vaccines and we need the support of the British public to come forward with vaccinations we were hearing. How, how much tolerance is there in the process? Now, suppose you miss your second vaccine by a week or you go away and you don't have it for six weeks after you have the first jab. What, what does that mean for your coverage, Dr Pollock? Yeah, so it is important to have both doses of the vaccine. Uh, and in the, the Pfizer-BioNTech trial, they were given three weeks apart. Um, 
we know from other studies that um, having a second dose later on can still provide that additional protection. I would very much encourage people to prioritize having both jabs and, and doing it um, as, as is described for this particular vaccine. But if it's not possible for them to get the second dose uh, for a personal reason, for example, they should still uh, try to have that second dose when they can, and that will maximise the protection that they're able to get from this particular vaccine. Professor Salisbury, some people might think, well, I've just had COVID, so I've got the same immunity as a vaccine. Are they right to think that, or should they have the jab anyway? No, I think everybody who is recommended to have the vaccine should undoubtedly have it. We don't know how long the natural infection lasts. We don't know yet how long the vaccine uh, protection lasts. But nevertheless, if you are invited to have this vaccine, irrespective of what has happened before, you undoubtedly should take up that offer and have the vaccine. So we don't know how often we'll, we might have to have it twice a year is what you're saying? No, I don't think anybody knows that. I mean, it could well be that this becomes a programme very similar to the seasonal influenza vaccination programme, and people in risk groups will be having flu vaccine every year, and they'll have a dose of, of coronavirus vaccine every year. That's still to play for. We don't know yet the duration of vaccine-induced immunity, and we don't know yet uh, if it's going to last a long time. So let's be hopeful, and we will need to monitor very carefully uh, what happens in the months and years to come. Dr Pollock, the, the Pfizer vaccine is based on a synthetic uh, substance, um, a sort of a trigger. The Oxford vaccine is based on a, a monkey uh, virus. What difference does that make for who, who can get it? I mean, if you're immunosuppressed, for example, should you be going for the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine rather than the Oxford vaccine? Yeah, I think those questions about vaccine design are important. And um, as we were hearing um, from Professor Salisbury, we should be having a vaccine if we were offered to have one. Uh, there are ongoing studies looking at these kind of questions in terms of particular risk groups. Uh, but if there's no particular contraindication for you to have a vaccine, then um, you should certainly have it. Uh, the design of the, of the two different vaccines um, does mean some differences in terms of how it works in, in the cell. They, they deliver a, a message to the cell for your cell to make the spike protein uh, from the coronavirus, the outside of the coronavirus. And then that's what causes the immune response. And for the RNA vaccines, they do that, as you said, in a completely synthetic way. Um, whereas uh, for the adenovirus vaccines, like the Oxford vaccine, they use a harmless virus to piggyback that message into the cell. Um, but it, in terms of uh, making decisions about which vaccine to have, again, that, that comes down to your, your own particular health uh, concerns and, and can be discussed with your GP. But if you're offered a vaccine, then we would certainly advise you to consider having it. Dr. Katrina Pollock, Professor David Salisbury, thank you both very much. Thank you.